MicroPython and Embedded Hardware. I'll let him talk about that. That's just our opening slide. Uh, welcome everyone online. I uh, will be keeping an eye on the chat, so if you have questions, drop them there, and I will relay them to Keith. Um, so this is the Spokane Python user group. Uh, we're part of the overall Spokane tech groups, which is composed of the .NET users group, the DevOps meetup or DevOps user group, and the Python user group. Uh, sponsored by Intellitech, which is the building you're in or the building you're seeing online. Um, we are always actively hiring developers, uh, particularly senior developers right now. So if you're ever looking to join an awesome workplace in the Spokane area, reach out. Uh, .NET user group typically meets on the second Tuesday of the month. I think right now they are publishing recordings from the Spokane.NET conference, so be on the lookout for those on the Intellitech YouTube channel. Spokane Python user group, also known as SPUG. Uh, we meet every third Thursday, or Tuesday, that should say Tuesday, uh, and every first Monday of the month in the morning. Um, if you're ever interested in speaking, reach out, you can figure something out. Uh, and finally, the DevOps users group, who are currently doing uh, monthly lunch and learns at lunchtime, uh, and those are just online only. I'm not sure when the next one is, but they're typically on the fourth Tuesday of the month. Follow Intellitech and Spokane Python on the socials. We have recently created a multitude of social media platforms for the Python user group. Um, we've got a Twitter account, which has been around for a little while. We've got a Facebook page and a LinkedIn page now. So, um, and actually, one more thing. Sorry, Keith. Uh, we also have a new Discord server. Um, a couple of people have been talking about that. I've never really moderated or organized a Discord server. If anyone like maybe you have done that before and uh, want to get in on that. I'm happy to hand you the keys to the kingdom, but I've created it. I thought it might be nice to have a place for people to chat in between our, our meetups. So um, we got a QR code. I'll drop the link on the YouTube chat. Uh, I told Matt Trentini, I think is his name. Uh, I'd give him in the MicroPython meetup in Melbourne, Australia a shout out. He responded to one of our Twitter posts saying that he would be joining. They actually have a meetup tomorrow, which is at like midnight tonight for all of us. So if anyone wants a double dose of uh, micro Python stuff, you can join that tonight as well. It was up that way last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do it again. Um, I think that's all I got. Let me go to the next slide. Welcome, Keith. Thanks for being here. Uh, I believe you still work at F5. I'm still contracted there. Still yeah. contracted there at F5. Keith has been coming to these for a while now, so glad to have you and excited to have you speaking. I will turn it over to you now. Um, in just a sec. Boom. Oh, perfect. And I can move this if that's going to be in the way. Is that all right? Ah, oh, that's great. All right, so I titled this MicroPython, the fast track to an IoT hellscape, because you can do so many things so quickly with no security, and it's great, and it's yes. super fun, <laughs> and uh, there's no, no guardrails. Uh, just kind of a quick layout of what we'll do, introduction. We'll take a closer look at Python. We'll kind of do a little quick start, a blinky light. Uh, we'll demo some, we were going to demo some custom hardware, but I couldn't get it to work, so you can look at it. Um, and then we'll demo some off-the-shelf hardware as well. And uh, just to kind of set the expectation, I am by no means a developer. I'm very much a hobbyist, and I do most of this stuff on the side for fun, and I do do hardware as a job. So I'm, I'm more versed in the hardware side of this than the Python side. But I feel like that's a pretty great uh, testimony to how easy it is to get up and running because I figured it out in a couple days. So you guys should be making like full sentient robots super fast. Um, introduction. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Keith Harris. Uh, I'm married to my wife Mandy. 12, 12 years, almost 12, somewhere in there. I've got four kids and. Uh, Pretty busy. I got my undergrad in 2011 in physics and then went back in 2021 and started up an electrical engineering undergrad. And we'll finish that eventually. It's a lot slower when you have a job. And uh, I work at uh, F5 Networks. I contract there as a hardware technician. 
So let's take a closer look at MicroPython. Uh, made by this guy, who I believe is an Australian. Uh, Dr. Damien P. George, 2013, they did a Kickstarter. And um, so it kind of surprised me that MicroPython is actually like 10 years old now. It's not, in my mind, it was this new thing that had sort of broken out, but it's been around a while and it is far, far more mature than I sort of realized as a layperson. Um, and then this was kind of a description I tore off the, the site. It's MicroPython's Lean Efficient Implementation, the Python 3 programming language. So you get almost all of the Python standard libraries, and it's been pared down to run on a microcontroller. So really kind of how I've thought of it is they've taken everything that the interpreter would need from an OS and then built that in C. And then they've used C to glue that down to the bare metal. That makes any sense to you guys, and if uh, if there's any questions, feel free to interrupt. I don't have a flow, so you're good. So what you get is almost all of Python three. There's some caveats to that, and there's a few things that even like right before I came, I was I was kind of finding. Um, right when you boot the board up, you get a serial-based REPL. So any board that you plug in that's running MicroPython, you can immediately talk to it like you have a, a Python terminal, which is, at first I thought kind of silly, but the more I used it, the more it was like, actually this is kind of useful for development and plays well to its strength. Uh, you also get anything that you uh, build out for MicroPython, that .py file is portable. You can drop that on any MicroPython board after you're done with it. You may have to change GPI your pinouts and, and how you're interacting with the hardware, but it is, it's not like if anybody's done Arduino where you compile that for that chip, and that's that, like you can't go move it anywhere else, and you can end up creating a pretty fragile house of cards if you're not careful. So it seems like MicroPython's done a, a better job at that. Um, but it, it's nothing's for free. You, uh, anything that's C-based is, just doesn't work. So NumPy, it turns out C and like Fortran, it's burned into NumPy. It's not going to run on a microprocessor. There's a few other little weird things like raw F strings. There's a bunch of caveats around F strings and a bunch of caveats around the super implementation. Um, but it seems like for the most part, you've got Python 3, asterisk mark, which I. For, for the whole thing, only like they can compile it down to 512 kilobyte. That's not, not too bad. Um, and you also have some hardware constraints. It'll run on almost any SOC, so SOC or system on chip. And I just grabbed a, an image so you guys can kind of picture that. So that's going to be any chip that's got um, some of these peripherals built in. So uh, m most of your ARM based, um, and then there's a few other flavors out there. Um, but you have to have two megabytes of memory available, which is rules out a big swath. Like most of your Arduino stuff won't do that. Your app mail, they have a few now that will. Um, so that two megabytes of memory is, is a fairly big constraint. And, and probably is what prevents this from being used a lot in industry because that's an extra bomb item you have to solder on a memory chip. And something like two megabytes is fairly expensive in the grand scheme of when you're when you're paying 0.0001 cents for chips and then you have to pay 50 cents that that's uh, something they're going to want to try and design out so um, and then anything in MicroPython that you really need some latency is is very difficult it, it's not impossible there are workarounds and at some point the workarounds you kind of have to wonder maybe this would have just been easier to do in C instead of <laughs> trying to band-aid your Python to, to make it fast um, but you can you can pre-compile your bytecode and have that live on memory, or you can write your libraries in C and interact with your your C-based libraries. Um, but any any sort of little latency stuff. So if you're doing any sort of really quick DSP digital digital processing or any sort of fine motor control, like they're not going to make a CNC based off MicroPython unless there's a lot of C libraries in there as well. And then here's just an example of some of the off-the-shelf hardware. Um, the PicoPie 
and the Pico Pi W, which is what this is, which is what I ended up with, um, your ESP8266 and most of the expressive chips will support MicroPython as well as uh, a lot of the ARM chips now. Um, again, it's got to have the, the memory and um, the uh, SOC architecture. Uh, so, so some of the applications that I've uh, I see getting having used it is the fast prototyping is the biggest one. Instead of when I've prototyped in C, you have to write code, compile it, upload it to the board. And if it's a custom board and you're going over like FTDI or JTAG, if your sketches get really big, that can take a few minutes. So now your whole workflow gets herky jerky and it's hard to run. Um, so this, where you just have a REPL and you want to build a serial buffer, you can do it, and we'll do we'll do a little REPL demo here in a sec. You can just put it in there like it's your your Python interpreter because it is. Um, and then any one-off applications like CVFX and a lot of proof of concept uh, being used in the industry. It was hard to find a lot of industry application because I, I felt like in the embedded world it's a pretty kind of stiff. Uh, like everybody's really got some opinions and nobody wanted to admit like yeah actually we do MicroPython on our medical devices I found a few companies <laughs> but like it, from what from what I was able to gather anybody that's using it in the industry it's heavily modified but there are I did find this cool Kickstarter so you can realize your dystopian <laughs> cyberpunk future this is actively happening right now that it looks kind of interesting I don't know but it is running off MicroPython and then TI with all the new calculators forked MicroPython, and so now you can uh, you can cheat on exams like more efficiently. <laughs> like, actually, being in school, there's no way. But like all you're allowed to get is like the the Nickelodeon Junior calculator. Once <laughs> you take any nice calculators on an exam. So let's do a just a quick start demo. I'm just gonna go to a white screen here. So the IDE I'm using is called Thani. Oh, let's see. It's a, there's like a couple second delay. I oh. Sorry. No, you're good. Um, I just can't tell which uh, screen I'm on. Oh, I know why. Because it's an extended display. Give me a second. I'm going to mirror. Okay, there we go. Thanks for doing all that research, though. Oh. Yeah, it's pretty good. no, it's pretty good recap. It's 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 kind of what it's it's kind of weird to have that like such a big Python project and kind of community because when you go to the MicroPython, the documentation is fantastic. Everything's super well laid out, and it's just been kind of I just have never like taken the time to look at it, and it's, it's pretty cool to see. So this is this is the IDE, and um, it sh if you've done any Arduino, it should feel fairly familiar. Um, let's see, you can see on here. So if you're watching online, we're talking to this guy. That's a Pico W, and hopefully, it works. So I'm just yeah, there we go. So I'm talking to this over serial, and so now I can. Uh, import the machine library which will define all my pins and then I can define like a variable for an LED it's a weird looking D are you able there to bump go. up the font size though? Uh, maybe I can probably zoom let's see no worries if not just okay. sometimes online it's hard let's see we'll lean really close uh, so like LED, see I wrote this down because I know I was going to forget. It's pin. Out. I think that should work. No. Hold on. I also saved it because I knew I would get nervous and then 
freak out and forget everything. You're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I see. I see. Might be part of the problem. <laughs> Almost there. Seeing it doesn't like pin. Is pin in the machine package? Should be. Do you have to do from machine import? Yeah, let's try that. Doesn't like it. Well, that's okay. Let's try pin. Sorry, guys. that and then let's just define a pin you might have to do machine doctrine yeah oh are you doing yeah that's, that's what I'm doing right now machine dot pin See, this is the part, this is why I lowered your expectations at the start. So, <laughs> and then we'll do... Um, Matt online says replace LED with a pin number. Uh, for the Pico W, oh, once yeah, LED... Oh, that's a const. LED is a const for... Yeah, there we go. And then we can do... So that is the difference. The Pico W is not very old. And so there were a few little nuances. Um, what's, that, what's that first parameter, like that LED in, in quotes? Like what, what is that doing? That's, that's defining, there's a, an onboard LED that will flash. Oh, gotcha. So that, that's just a burned in for the Pico. Um, I think in, on the, the bog standard Pico, it's, uh, it's just assigned a, a pin without the, uh, the const. So we can say while true. A toggle. There's that stuck H key again. Toggle dot LED. And, oh, it's, uh, hold on. We're gonna M. Oh, it goes to sleep after. Port sleep. Is what yeah, you probably can zoom in on the ego too. Yeah, I'll do that. That's the nice thing with that camera. Good idea. Uh, do you have to import time? I did. Oh, yep. sorry. Just reading the, the chats. <laughs> <laughs> They're all like tearing, <laughs> tearing their hair off. So is it? <laughs> we did this last. We did this last sleep? night. So yeah, it's gonna be time dot sleep, and then I think it's a uh, LED dot. like cool ideas I'd basically be Steve Jobs doing this demo and uh, it ain't it, it ain't happening all right we'll come back to this oh uh, but we did we did get the LED to turn on which is interesting I think we can do 
Yeah, we'll come back to that. You could do, um, we can go back to the LED dot value, and then you just pass in. Yeah, you can. You pass in, uh, uh, you to pass in the current value and opposite of it. <laughs> so do it. So it would be while true. So do like, uh, let's see, hold on. I actually don't think you can do I think you'd like toggle, I didn't mind toggle. I'll do toggle, just to like sleep. Yeah, like sleep. Follow oh, that one in like. Yeah. Is this the power brick we unplugged Austin? <laughs> yeah, try timed off sleep, that's perfect, yeah. Oh, we're getting there, guys. True. Yeah. There we go. Okay. No. Ow. Oh, I. I think it's. Yeah, I think it's. LED dot toggle. Nah. Okay. Well, we're gonna cut it loose because. I don't think anybody online wants to watch me just mash away. I went through every possible option. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get, we'll get, it'll work like when I go home. Let's see. I mean, I don't really need red code either, so but it's hard. We'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I should have logged into chat GPT. All right, so one of the things I did for this demo uh, which our oh, we're, we're swapped. Hold on. There we go. Uh, I did make some custom hardware, which I will put on here. And actually, you guys will uh, go ahead and pass it around. It is semi-operable. There was uh, some issues with the, the crystal oscillator. <laughs> um, but I figured it would be worthwhile to walk through kind of what that workflow looked like and maybe encourage you guys, if you've never tried any sort of hardware design, to give it a shot because it's actually pretty fun. can be fairly inexpensive as long as you're not getting crazy parts. Um, and when it works, it's uh, pretty rewarding. <laughs> I haven't got that dopamine hit yet. <laughs> So, uh, if you guys have uh, never heard of KiCad, that is a pretty amazing open source, I believe it's mostly Python as well, um, project that uh, you can use to go from schematic to actual PCB layout. And that's kind of what I laid out in the slide. So this left one is the schematic for that controller. And I've got in the middle here, microcontroller. I've got my power, my memory, crystal oscillator, I have an IMU on there because the thought was was to get uh, position data and then update the LED array that's on the, the top of the board or on the, the back of it as you hold it there. I didn't side those LEDs on because they're kind of expensive and when I realized the board wasn't working, I didn't feel like uh, soldering because I think they're like a buck a piece. So I'll, I'll save that for another project. But, um, so after, after you do get all this done, and you get everything connected how you want. There's decoupling capacitors. There's most 99% of this is what you guys do in web, where you just go through and read an API. So this this microcontroller has a 600-page document. You can scroll through. It gives you recommended connections, like what values that they recommend for decoupling capacitors and what you should use for a crystal. So there's honestly not a bunch of like really pure electrical engineering that goes into it. It's most people can just kind of stumble through the documentation and get a working board. Um, when you say crystal, what so, does that mean? Oh, okay, so, really yeah, no, 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 no. I'll, please stop me if I'm, I'm having a great look. time. So the, the microcontroller, <laughs> it needs, a, uh, you know, when you, when you buy your, your Pentium D and it's like 2.7 gigahertz or whatever. Yeah. Um, that is, that is the frequency at which the controller is operating at. So there's a crystal on there that is pulsing that frequency, and that's what is timing that chip out. So if you wanted to overclock the chip, you could throw a different frequency uh, uh, oscillator on there. You know, it might work, it might not. You would probably have to do some math to figure out 
because there's all these other variables involved. Um, but uh, a lot of microcontrollers now too have an internal crystal that you can use, and I believe that one does. But I, I wanted something that was a little more stable, um, which I think I did the opposite because I didn't do my math right. I got I flew too close to the sun on that one. So, um, and so after after you do connect, make all your connections, you've read your documentation, then it just pukes it out onto a board or onto just a blank canvas, and you have to manually just kind of drag everything where you want it, and you start getting your layout and what you think makes sense. And then after a lot of time and kind of suffering, you end up going through and routing everything and making sure it all is connected. You'll get, like, I'm super abbreviating because it's kind of out of scope, but it's kind of cool. Um, you can get, you, you can get like 99% done with a board and then not be able to route that one last line and you'll get stuck and you'll have to redo it all over mm -hmm. again. And it's, it, routing is, is an art. And this is terrible, terrible, terrible routing, but it's a two-layer board, so it's it's kind of a dog pile on, on how to do things. There, at F5, they typically use 29-layer boards, and it's like uh, it's not even 5D chess. Like it, the amount of thought that goes into it takes years, so it's it's kind of soul-crushing. When I I, sh I took this to my senior EE, and he was like, "Oh, okay, yeah, look at this." <laughs> I'm play with my so Lego box. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you use to print your boards? I use for this one. I use JLC PCB, okay. which uh, was like scary fast. <laughs> yeah. I was a little surprised, like, because from just starting from going from the schematic to having a board in hand. I I started the schematic two weeks ago, and then I had a board. The board came in on uh, late Friday. And so I had this weekend to kind of debug it, and uh, they're exclusively out of China, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. They they like sent it on a rocket from like <laughs> Shenzhen or something. I don't know how it got here so fast. It was like incredible. Usually, I if I working. if I can help it, I'll use OSH Park. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It ended up Montana. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was close. Yeah. yeah. FedEx for me. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's what it was. It's just a DHL balloon. <laughs> uh, usually, I use OSH. OSH OSH Park, if I can help it. Like, I do really like them, but it's really tough to beat. Like, they're sub a dollar a square inch. Like, OSH Park is like five dollars a square inch. So, making a board through them can get kind of spendy. Um, and then there's some assembly involved because it just comes as a bare board. And so, the, the quickest way I found to assemble that microcontroller, which has got kind of the pins that are tucked under, which is really difficult to solder by hand, is I stole my wife's iron. I put it under the scope, and you just heat it up. And once that solder flows, the whole uh, board, you'll see it kind of lock into place, and then it's usually 99% done. I think I had to retouch up a little bit, but it was, mm -hmm. it was close enough. Um, and then I realized I was short on capacitors, so I found another board in my hoard of electronics, and I ended up stealing these two capacitors to throw on the board, too, because I was... I wish my DigiKey order got split up, and so the rest of it will come in like two days. Was it weird for a manufacturer in China to make you one order? They made me five. Five is a minimum. Okay. Um, and that's kind of their thing. There's uh, them, PCB Way. There's a whole slew of these manufacturers that cater to just the, the small run audience, yeah. um, which I think is great. How like, much is it for five boards? So to do those five boards and to rush it, so it was two-day manufacturing time, and to get it shipped here, I think it was like nineteen dollars. What? Oh yeah, God. yeah. It's like I, I don't know how anybody could yeah. ever compete with yeah. that. Um, and I just priced out because I want to redo this board as a four-layer to have some cleaner routing, and a four-layer board with the standard lead times. It's like and make it a little bigger so I don't have components on the back. Uh, a four-inch by four-inch four-layer board was like nineteen dollars for five of them. It's, it's, Super cheap. Can you, um, super cheap. Can you explain the layers real quick? Do it. <laughs> like layers. Oh, oh, is that on just the like board. Because you have two of those. No, or, no, no. So, or? so these are. This is a populated board. <laughs> this is. I feel so dumbass. No, 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 no. This is. I. I want you guys to stop me because like that's the world I live in, and I just breeze over. So on this board, I'll, I'll kind of hold it under the camera a little bit. There's a, a top and a bottom layer. Mm -hmm. Um, and so. In between this, it's uh, basically fiberglass, FR4 is what it's called. 
And so any of these darker or these uh, lighter copper areas that you see on here, these are, these are, these are the lighter areas are copper, and these uh, darker areas are where the copper is not around. So you can see where the traces are. Um, and you guys can pass it around too if you want to relook at it. So would uh, a four layer have like a middle part that you can't even see from the outside? Correct, yeah. Um, so yeah, and so like a, a 29 layer board, or yeah, it's 29, it's like two 14 layer boards sandwiched together. So how and thick does that get? They're pretty thick, it's like almost a quarter inch there. Oh. And, they're, and there's like connections going between each of the... Yeah, so those are, those are called vias. So if you look on, let me go back on this board, any of these uh, yellow dots, those are vias. And so that's a jump in between uh, mm -hmm. one layer to another. So mm -hmm. that's basically going up or down as you're looking at it. Right, yeah, let me, let's see if this will this will work. Yeah. Did it default back to my, to two? Huh, give me just a second again. Yeah, get it. This I know this is like kind of out of scope, but so pretty much it's all copper, and then they take away what they don't need. Okay, so it's gonna go. Uh, you, the green is what's called your silk screen, and then it's gonna go copper, fiberglass, copper, silk screen. Yeah, I was just wondering because uh, like it's yeah, you know, like these big swaps of you know like that like means all copper, like that's all conductive. Yeah. And they just kind of like make a negative around the path they want. So, so, so those big, those big, those are called pores. Those yeah. big areas, those are just ground planes. Okay. I just tied that. I said that that's going to be ground, and it makes it easier. So you can just, like, every you don't have to route all of your ground pins to that chip, like okay. that. You just jump it right to that ground plane right there. Okay. Okay. So that's that, if that makes sense. So that's an, an intentional design, not just a byproduct manufacturer. Uh, correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I can show you guys the, the actual KiCad file later. We'll, we'll keep rolling. Um, yeah, and then put it under the scope, solder it. Um, but I, I think that's super, it is very, it's not, it's something that you could do without an EE. You don't need an EE degree. Most of the stuff that I did here is not something I learned in school. It's stuff I picked up on YouTube. And actually, uh, at the end of this presentation, I have a whole bunch of links uh, if you guys want to go out and look at that, um, Digi uh, DigiKey, they they provide you know that's the like Amazon of digital components. They have like hours and hours and hours of tutorials on how to do this, awesome. um, and it's very very well done. Like I'm a little jealous because these are like most of these are only like a year or two old. Yeah, it's like ah, I wish I'd had that a couple years ago. I'd have been I'd have been so much cheaper for me. Um, so let's do another demo, but I swear this one will work. I have a faulty chip that I have not known how to fix for so long, so that's cool. I'm definitely going to check out some of those videos. Maybe I can oh, yeah. pop it up. Learn the ways. And well, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit now. What? Where am I? Because my display should. Oh, it. Florida, maybe? Yeah, it looks like you're on the. <laughs> that's STS1. You can tell by the white fuel tank. Duplicate. There we go. Okay, we're going back into the editor here with a pre done up demo for a stepper motor. And so, to give a little bit of background, a stepper motor is not just a DC motor, it will actually take discrete increments, steps, hence the name. Um, and stepper motors have to be driven typically by either a square wave or, or something like it. Is it this chunky guy? Yeah, that big boy right there. And so this also requires an extra bit of hardware. This green piece is a, a driver. And what it's doing is it's taking the signal off of the Pico and then it's interpreting that as you know higher lows and then stepping the motor appropriately. And it has to take a 24 volt devices here. Um, Let's see. Let's get interpreter back. And then let's give this. So this should just wiggle. So I put this, there's this whole class played with that uh, sets up um, your, your power ons, which you don't need for this application. 
and then there's a step and it's just a for loop and it's just toggling that value on and off and then there's a, a, a rest time in between and that's all this really is doing and then there's a few iterations of that with angles and revolution so I'm using the revolution uh, function here Ooh. look at that and so I, yeah you can I, I think I'm printing out as well um, and so to do this in Arduino is pretty similar but it's pretty cool to just have it up here in the REPL so I can sit here and demo a motion and figure out like is that what I wanted was that too far or, you know whatever you're wanting to do for your application and I haven't had to compile or really upload anything or do mm -hmm. it which is really nice when when you're trying to move fast and, and again plays well to that uh, rapid prototyping. So you can like just make a change on your code and then just like save and yeah it, it, it yeah just so like if I want uh, if I want to do it slower. Let's see, I think I can just change this value. And this is just uh, how long it's dwelling in between the, the on and off. Mm. It starts to slow down. It's like hot, hot reload. I've got the power! Yeah. So what's your what yeah. kind of this cable is connecting that to your computer? Uh, this is just USB micro. So this is having to be driven by this guy. Just in case you're thinking I'm driving the stepper from my laptop. That wouldn't work. So for the Amish guy in the back, <laughs> are you, you're not compiling this, you're just, it's interpreted on the fly? Correct. So the interpreter is running on the chip. And it's, like it's two meg to yeah. two megs. Two yeah. meg on the chip. Okay. Actually, that chip is actually sixteen meg. There's a little more headroom there. Um, but yeah, it's it's so this what I have down here the shell. Right. That, that is that the chip. Live. That's the interpreter. That was on the yeah. chip. Okay. And so I'm just pushing out of here. I could copy paste this into the shell, but but it's it's the same as like your little terminal pie chart. Sure. Have. Okay. So you're okay. I just I was waiting for the uh, compiling. I know like, that's seeing that. That's the that's okay. that rapid prototyping. Like you don't have to do that, which for for most most stuff is probably not that big of a deal. But I, it just makes it that much easier. I'll slow it down. Yeah, that's a little bit more. Those and like I can kill halfway through, and then reconnect. A minute or more to do an Arduino compile, even for something yeah. basic like this. Yeah, and so if I go too low, it actually kind of freaks out that driver. So see, it stops moving right and doesn't know. Since it, since this is an open feedback loop, it doesn't. It's assuming that the stepper went as many steps as I told it, and if it doesn't, then it doesn't know any better. It's going to keep trucking. Rotary encoders are kind of expensive, so that is not a part of this demo. Me, I'll up that value. I think I think this was kind of the sweet spot. Rotary encoder being <coughs> becomes cognizant of what's done and gets a feedback. Yeah, so you could you could in theory put it not there. You can you can put a rotor, rotary encoder on that shaft, and then that will give you uh, what's called gray code back to your controller. And all a simple rotary encoder is is it'll be like a a patterned disk with so increments and so in, in an optical sensor so it'll see high low high low high low high low and then you'll have two of those discs on a ring mm -hmm. or not two you'll have two patterns on, on a disc and you can use that to interpret am I going forwards because my pin pin zero or pin five went high and then pin six went high and then I know that that means I'm moving forward or if it goes the other way pin six went high then pin five means I'm going the other way so there's there's ways, to, sorry, I'm like blowing through that. Really, I know it's confusing. I can this guy's a clock maker. He knows yeah. all about those rotary parts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so pretty much it's out of phase so you can get a, exactly, yeah. a waveform by its motion. Then you have a stationary and then one moving on your shaft and then it can tell how far it's moved, how many rotations. Right, okay. yeah, and you can get really, really accurate encoders. And, um, cool. We've got uh, and then you can, I had an encoder I don't, think, I don't think I brought it because it was like sort of a half-baked half -baked demo and I wasn't super happy with it. But you can get those, the, those, that feedback from it fairly straightforward. It was like two lines of code. So like a, a very expensive 3D printer might have encoders. Maybe. They, they do it a different way. Um, 
and and I still don't like I watched my Prusa that I had at work, and they they do not they they run it they run it out they run every axis out to full length, and then until basically it's skipping, and then they they can look at how much current the motor's drawing and then infer like oh yeah that's the end, I know that oh. it took so many steps, and so if it skips, they have ways of kind of catching that, but it's not perfect. It's not like a rotary encoder would be. Mm -hmm. But there, there are other ways to kind of hem in your, your motion. By skip, you mean skip the steps. Yeah, it's not yeah. accurate anymore. Right, yeah. So if you if you tell it to take five steps, and then it skipped on the third one, and now it's only taking four steps, oh, gotcha, gotcha. and then that's a compounding error over, you know, like a 3D printer or whatever. Um, so a rotary encoder. Is that an expensive piece of kit, or is it just for if you were to put it on a stepper? Yeah, they're like a couple hundred bucks. Okay, <laughs> you can you can do like you could because like your stereo knob like you use in your car, that's a rotary encoder. That's a type of rotary encoder. I've seen people use those ones to kind of couple them to stepper motors and get feedback loops going. Um, those just aren't designed to be cycled that much. Like okay. you will, where you'll they'll physically break down after a while. That's using something like just plates with brush contacts or something like that instead of the optical drive that you're talking about. You could, yeah. There there are some more contact methods. I think the optical is like the standard. Like I can see you're doing tens of thousands of revolutions. Yeah, you don't. Want yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But you could absolutely make your own little. I mean, you could even go. Buck wild with the PCB board, and you could you could do something like kind of the sky's the limit with that. And that's actually something that's really cool getting into the PCB design because that stuff's super 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 accurate down to the mill. PCB being PCB, sorry, oh. yeah, not the drug, the printed circuit board. <laughs> oh, right. um, yeah, okay. that stuff's super super accurate. So I've seen people make like fine jigs and stuff for other like not electronic related at all. Mm -hmm. But the manufacturer can make these really, really precise shapes. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that gets sort of in the hacky land. Uh, the other thing we'll do is I've got a little OLED, and so how this is working is there is a data protocol called I2C, and that's a two-wire protocol, and all it is is a clock and a data line, and you can build a packet out, and you can send, uh, you'll send uh, a message over the bus. And whoever has that address will execute on that message, whatever it is. Um, yeah, and I got two. Actually, I have it right here. I two wire one. protocol, but then you usually use like another two for power, right? If, like you have sensor. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. That. So yeah, yeah. Two wires if for data. Two wire. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, technically you do have to run power. It's, but it's not. It's not like the other protocol that kind of goes with this is SPI serial peripheral interface. And that one is a clock, and then you have a data in, data out, and a chip select. And those four wires have to run to everything. And so you can imagine when you start routing stuff with SPI, it's exhausting. Because you're just like, oh my gosh. Like, it'll give, in KiCad, it'll give you um, like how many traces you still have to route. And it's really depressing when you're like, I've been banging on this for like, two hours and I still have like 500 traces to do. Like, like I, I think, I can't remember, this, even this little baby board had something like four or 500 connections to be made on it, which is. So when you're doing those traces, you're like crazy. manually routing? There's yeah, well, the KiCad will kind of help you out. Okay. Like you can do an auto route. Yeah. As far as I, at least F5, like auto route is like, it might throw you out a window if you were to mention that. Like that is like a dirty word. Um, I've seen people do it. It's to me, it's it's easier. It's easier to just route it how you want, and then and then you know how it is. First is like you hit auto route and it goes blah, and then if something doesn't work, now you got to go figure it out. <laughs> now you're stuck trying to understand what the machine did. It seems like this is a kind of problem AI would be good at. Yeah. <laughs> Quick yeah. interjection, yeah. Uh, just from people online. A couple comments. Uh, Matt mentioned micro Python can actually run in sixteen kilobytes of RAM. Maybe maybe I missed about kilobytes. Yeah. yeah. Um, he also. Although I, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Cause yeah. So technically, a one meg chip will run it. I could not get that to work right. Like it, gotcha. it would not run. 
Yeah. I think the difference might be RAM versus ROM or memory. Yeah. Did I miss? Um, I'm just reading what they're yeah. saying. Uh, one other comment from him was uh, rotary, rotary encoders are the dials that output a pattern so you can tell people when people rotate a dial. Just encoders are the back of steppers to determine a position. Um, Casey also mentioned from a few minutes ago that 3D printers use current sensing in the driver. Right. So, yeah. 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 And so some, some steppers do have encoders built into them. This one does not. And uh, those are the really, really, really expensive ones. It can't be. Um, so this, I'll run this real fast. Let's see if it goes. Woo! There we go. It's upside down. But that does, that's the MicroPython logo. Mm -hmm. You can see on the OLED there. <clears throat> um, again, all of this is doing, so we're defining our I2C bus, seeing which pins those are on. I ended up having to put a, a little sleep in there because it was setting up too fast. I think there's a little bit of latency. And then there's a, I imported the, the uh, display driver for the SSC 1306, which is the chip that is running this. Again, it's, it's kind of that reading your documentation. And then, uh, and then it's just writing some just really basic lines. And then there's some string, it can take some strings. You can actually set up buffers. It gets, it gets more advanced than this, um, but I didn't, I didn't want to crash and burn, so I kept it simple. Um, and actually, you can see I commented out. This is all it takes for rotary encoders right here. I was trying to write to the OLED with this, but abandoned it. Um, <clears throat> yep. Let's go back here. All right, so I have the, the other cool stuff section that uh, I didn't really fit, but we'll talk about it anyways. So the ESP01 board, which is... This guy right here for the camera. So this is this will run MicroPython, sort of. It it has a one meg chip. It wouldn't run it, and it would compile MicroPython. And every I found all these tutorials, and it was like I follow it through. It was great. It all compiled, and then when you'd actually go to run something, it just wouldn't work. Just it was just totally dead. So what I ended up doing is I noticed that the whatever um, all. I noticed that the uh, the memory, the flash chip that it was using, was really similar to the one I had spec'd out for my custom board. And so what I ended up doing was cutting off. You can see it kind of hanging off right here. I snipped it off and then soldered on my own uh, 16, uh, or it's 128 mega bit which I think is 60 megabyte um, board, uh, memory on there, and it all worked, so. That just, I, like, that's just okay with that? It's like yeah, so, so that's, memory. like my existence at F5 is manufacturers keep their pinouts, their standards for how many chips work, and they're gonna be the same. So that was a, a um, I think that's a SOT 08 uh, layout, and it's an SPI flash, and they just happen to be close enough to where it mostly works. There's still some issues, but I was pretty surprised because it was sort of like a latch ditch. Like, well, I've already spent like three hours on this. Like, I've been deep into like, you know, uh, C code, like trying to use the expressive tool to flash like memory sectors. It's like, screw that. I'm just gonna snip it off. And if it's, these boards, I picked these boards up like four or five years ago, and they're like less than a dollar piece like where they were at the time there yeah. and it was like oh cool like they have wi-fi on them and like, so this board will we'll try and demo it but i was really flaky for me last night um it will run a wi-fi network you can connect to it and it will serve html on the little tiny boards which oh, is awesome artem is my witness it did work once <laughs> <laughs> can we get that for the gate out front austin what was it can we get one of those little guys just out there running our gate <laughs> Yeah, well, that's when you can figure out if MicroPython's garbage collection is any good, because that's some of the complaints I've seen. <laughs> so yeah, maybe after like 30 up. days, yeah. it might not work anymore. <laughs> or you might have to like periodically reboot it. Um, the I've, There's a project called TinyML that is doing um, some machine learning on the Pico. 
And uh, I have not gotten a lot of time to look into that, but it looks interesting. Somebody had a project out where uh, they were looking at oscillations from an accelerometer and then inferring motion uh, from that on a machine learning model. And I believe those, you can build a model in Keras or I think it's SciPy, I can't remember which ones. Um, and then I believe we had a PyScript presentation a while back. There's, a, this is like, as a, there was a podcast like three weeks ago on combining PyScript and MicroPython to kind of help that latency issue that we were mm. having. So. Yeah, um, if you can serve up an HTML, then you just throw some Python in there. Yeah, so it's, there's, there's, I, I included some stuff at the end of this presentation that I'll upload at the, uh, my GitHub, and we can link out, and um, you guys can go check that out. But, yeah, to summarize, I don't think this is like the end all be all of embedded solutions. Um, I think there's still a lot of value in being close to the metal with C. And when you write C, you just feel better than everybody. <laughs> so you don't quite get that with this. But my goodness, it's fast. Like from going to, I pulled this out of the Adafruit box to getting a blinking light, which we couldn't get tonight for some reason, um, is very fast. Um, and having the REPL up is uh, pretty impressive and allows you to move pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, makers rejoice. Go go forth and, and do terrible things in IoT. I did find right before I came here, there is some better ways, because all of the Wi-Fi examples have uh, the password just in clear text. I was like, surely there's <laughs> gotta be a better way. So there are some libraries that try and work around that a little bit. I don't think it's a great implementation, but uh, um, yeah. And that's, let's see, that's all I got. Yep, uh, I don't know, there's my LinkedIn email. And then I'll make sure all these links at the end. There's some videos. Uh, if you really want to back that monocle Kickstarter, that's on there. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I got. And then we can, if you guys want to mess around with some of this stuff and check it out and, and try your hand at some hardware, I brought a few LEDs and stuff. We can try blinking some LEDs. Uh, we'll try and get this Wi-Fi up off the ground. And uh, yeah, that's it. Any other questions? Is it pretty easy when I was, I can't remember, MicroPython or isn't there another? There, oh, oh, there is. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. There's, there's CircuitPython out yes. there, which is Adafruit's fork of MicroPython. And it is, um, it's MicroPython with some train wheels on it. It's, uh, it's a little, little more hemmed in. And they have all of their boards are like really, really dialed in. So Adafruit will make some, you know, Python feather board or whatever it is. And then they'll have it uh, like all perfect and so you don't have to sit in like the compiler and do like CMake on like custom bootloaders and stuff. For those, I think they set it up to show up as a USB drive, right? On, on yes. Yeah. Is, is so this the same way? Same way. Or? So actually, we'll, we'll do that right now. So it's not a true like serial bus type idea, like it. You it get is no. It, so so how how this works? And so here's what we'll do. All right, just for the console. Now. So we'll we'll unplug it. There's a button on here, and when you hold this, this will put you into a bootloader mode, which you can see now it's it's being seen as a, uh, um, it, so you're, you're getting to talk directly to the flash. And then from there, you can use Thonny, which is kind of why I stuck with it, because it had all this integration. Um, you can do this like in the, in the terminal as well. But you can say like, hey, um, let's go install update. So this is how you'd install it right out of the box. Say, hey, there's this volume. This is the variant I want. It's got a whole bunch of other boards on here. And so we're the Pico Pi W. And this is great. It's the only version right now is unstable. <laughs> so I saw that, I was like, oh, we're, just, we're gonna roll with it. And then you do an install. And this is, this is where I'm stuck on my board. So my board will actually connect and this is called like the bootloader mode but once I get to this I can't get past this step on my board okay. 
because the uh, there's, there are two bootloaders. There's a bootloader on the chip that's kind of, it's burned in by the manufacturer, you can't change it. Then there's a second bootloader, and that one you can make changes to. And I need to go through and make a change to uh, some of the wait times on the, the crystal. And But then I have to go and, and compile it, so then I just didn't have time to do that. Um, so then that's done. So then you close that, okay. And then, there we go, now we're, we're serial through USB. Nice. Okay. okay. And, and, and that's talking directly to it. Okay. And is it pretty easy? Uh -huh. well, one of the things, because I'm working on like a product idea right now, so it's like, I don't want people to be able to pull off the code super easy. That's, I think, one of the limitations. Right. Is that, that's, to me, a strength and a weakness. So like, yeah. <laughs> when I've done internal tools for the previous company I worked for, um, it would have been really nice to just have a .py file on Flash yeah. where you could, because they've since called me, or I've had people in my old department say, like, hey, do you know where any of that firmware is? It's like, I don't know, I gave it to you guys. And they can't, and it's like, they can't get it off the board because it's all on assembly now. Um, so having, but yeah, if you're making a product, I think there are ways to mitigate that, but I'm not positive. I was still kind of researching, because I personally too have a couple ideas I want to implement. Yeah. It's a hesitant. really, really long plain text password. <laughs> <laughs> there is a place in Coeur d'Alene called Gizmo that's like a, yeah. what's the what's the word, like a shared workspace? And they have it's like... It's, <clears throat> it like help you get started. Like start okay, so it's like, like, like a like space here in town. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't know if there was any in Spokane, but I, I saw this one and they had like soldering stuff and a whole bunch of like electronic components and stuff, I guess. If anyone didn't have their own stuff. Patrick studied a couple of classes over there. And they, they did a, an Adreno with C to play around. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it feels very similar. Like the Thani IDE kind of feels similar. Yeah. Um, you can do C on this. Like you can sit down and you can set it up with VS Code and you can run C. It is difficult. Like it is not as streamlined as Arduino is. Um, but I think with that, you like Arduino is kind of. A stripped down C plus plus, or it's kind of weird. Whereas this, it's it's proper C. Like you get everything. Um, as far as far as I've seen. So when it comes to embedded devices, because you mentioned like C being it's kind of the the standard. The yeah. standard is and it's it's classic C, not C plus plus or C sharp. It's kind of it kind of depends on the chip. Like um, some some uh, some shops like if, especially if you're doing TI chips, it's all C. TI being Te Texas Instrument. Sorry, okay. I'm, just, I'm just abbreviating everything. Okay. Uh, Texas Instrument. It's going to be C. Um, it just kind of depends. A lot of the STM 32s, which is this blue board up here, okay. it's a different flavor microcontroller. They're more in the C plus plus land, but they will also run C. Um, I think it also just kind of depends on how you set up your compiler. Okay. Do you see it like? Some of the other trending languages like Rust or something like that, or Go. I've so seen like, I've seen in re embedded Rust. I don't know huh. what like I I've I've just briefly there was like a Hacker News article or something. Yeah, so um, I'm saying that's supposed to like have a lot of the similarities of C, but being easier to work with. Yeah, so it's some of the more I get more safe, right? Yeah. Uh, and like uh, Art was over the other night, and there there's a C sharp board. You can you can run C sharp yeah, on embedded. The so. meta board. But it has all, yeah. all the same limitations of low latency doesn't work as spec by the yes yeah it's it's because it's running an interpreter any any of the high if you put a high level language on embedded there are prices to pay <laughs> you just can't get away from that right now that being said like uh, you can do like this will do multi because this is a, a dual core processor so you can multi thread and you can async on this. Hmm. So I'm sure you could get into like some terrible trouble <laughs> that way. So we, uh, is that like it physically has two cores, or is it like a core that has the capacity to do things like um, uh, hyper threading, where it like virtualizes itself? I, I believe because this is the Cortex M0 Plus, I believe that is physically two cores. Okay. Might Google that though um, after because I'm, I'm not positive. Uh, I know a lot of the STM arms are uh, four cores. And what that looks like, I, I included at the end of that in that summary at the end, there's some links to some multi-thread and some async tutorials that I went through and was like, okay, like this is pretty far over my head. Like, maybe later. I think it'd be really cool, to, like 
because typically like in, a, in an embedded device you just have a big event loop or callback and that's just how you're, you're checking all your prints blah, 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 and you're just doing that constantly it would be really cool so if you want to drive a display you have to be really smart about it because that'll mess you up if you're also like you have to get really clever with what are called interrupts so you can set pins if something happens on that pin it will stop your C++ loop and, and go do this little side quest for a second and come back um, you you have to get really really clever and having multiple cores would be pretty cool to like just set hey this core you're you're the display driver core and then this core you're going to be scanning io and how that actually works in practice i don't know yet i'm, I'm going to try it i really want to try it but i haven't got there yet how often do you find yourself uh scavenging like little microchip boards before you throw away electronics. Oh, I don't throw them away. <laughs> <laughs> my wife can attest to this. I, I like my whole basement's exploded right now because like it's like I need a twenty two picofarad resistor. I I bet I have one somewhere. And I'm going through schematics and looking and ah oh, I knew this one would have it. And I popped those off. So now I have like a bunch of inoperable boards. So um, I like I I keep all electronics, even if I have no use for them at all, or they're broken. And I, I just like I'm like this has a microchip on it. Maybe I'll use that one day. And I like have it in I have yeah. no idea how to use any of it. The I've gotten more picky with what I keep now, like yeah. like stepper motors and stuff like that. F five has like a uh, a scrap bin that I'm like constantly walking by. Yeah. Like, that's a weird looking fan in there. I'm gonna take that home <laughs> and see if I can get that to run. You have like a golden unicorn like component you've been looking for and you haven't found yet no so like what so this this board has an excel an imu on the back which an inertial measurement unit has accelerometers and gyros in it which is pretty wild considering how small uh that is which is that little guy right there um uh those are really hard to, that stupid chip is like eight bucks <laughs> i want to try it because i have another project i want to use yeah. this for and when i i I got them, you know, I got a couple, so I burn a few up, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, those are hard to find right now. Mm -hmm. Like, the chip shortage is pretty well kind of easing up, except for, like, I am user, like, impossible to get. And, uh, like, any sort of, like, temp pressure sensor, they're kind of tough to get right now. Like, you can get them, but you're just, they're chips, like, I've been doing this long enough to where, like, I'll see it's like, oh, that's the BP2080. Like, I remember when that was, like, Five cents, and now they're selling them for like, you know, fifteen dollars. It stinks. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, now any any especially raw components are pretty good to get. Yeah. I have a whole bag of chips in my desk drawer. I don't know what they are. They just they were all loose chips. So yeah, and I'll probably never use them. Garage sale. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I want to be, be I want to be the old guy that like has yeah. the most kick-ass garage sale. <laughs> <laughs> 20 bucks for the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> no It'll probably be in a state sale. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Couple of uh, comments from people still with us online for the Q&A. Uh, SAMD and Atmel. Yep. So Do those ring a bell? Yep. <laughs> they, Have C++ uh, compilers, says yeah. Casey. The, so that's Arduino. Okay. The SAMD is like they're, they're like beefed up, and that does run MicroPython. Gotcha. Um, um, Matt also mentioned there were some workarounds for some of the constraints you were talking about in MicroPython. Uh, you were talking about threading. He said threading depends on the micro. Some, like ESP, are based on free RTOS tasks. Right. Some are genuinely multi-core, like RP, RPi, Pico. Yeah, yeah. so that's a great. So the RPi is generally two different cores, like this Expressive 8266 is probably running RTOS, and there's other things going on there that I probably don't understand. So that's a great point. Yeah. <clears throat> cool, yeah, there you can, so if, if you had, if you were doing like motion control, and you knew you, you wanted to like really quickly snap some steppers around or something, you could write that portion in C, and then call that, and work around some of those latency issues. Or, and, and I haven't totally figured out how to do it, you can, because your interpreter eventually makes bytecode, and you can kind of pre-compile your bytecode and have that laying there as well, which would be another way to, to quick and make that faster. Does it still 
MicroPython still makes bytecode. It doesn't just. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. How I I wanted to be able to present better on how that part worked, but after a while, I was like, yeah, I'm, I don't have a CS degree, and I don't know how this works, and I'm not very interested in this. I'm bouncing. Totally. <laughs> I was thinking the interpreter would just like skip that and go like right to like assembly. I don't know. <laughs> That is from what I from what I see the interpreter is very like like it's not a complete ground up rewrite of the interpreter. Mm -hmm. It's very much uh, it's very close to what the proper Python three interpreter is, mm -hmm. with like a few little baby exceptions. And then all of the glue, all the interaction that the interpreter would do with your OS, um, that is then replaced by C. And, and that's how it's, you're gluing the interpreter to the chip, and you're gluing the glue is C. And that's probably an overly simplistic way, and I encourage all of you to, to not take my word for it, because that was kind of, I was just really like, okay, I think I can wrap my mind around that. Um, that's as deep as I'm going to go. Cool. <coughs> See? Cool. Cool. Well, um, if you guys want to come mess around, I've got some LEDs. You can try, we can try the Blinky for real this time. Um, and then you can sort of mess around with the Wi-Fi. I don't even know what time it is. So it's I'm gonna hurry it shut her down. I'll end the stream for the online people if we're done with questions. But everyone here in person, feel free to yeah, hang thank out. Thank you to the online stuff. people for dialing in. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's there's some good comments on here. So, um, and if it's cool with you, I'll I'll add some of those links to like the the YouTube yeah. video so yeah. people online can just go check that out. Cool. All right. Thanks, online people. <laughs> Thank <Bye>. you. <laughs> now we can do the